Soil is the foundation of our food system. And its health is essential for sustainable agriculture. But what exactly is soil health? Well, soil health to me is, is something that uh, I feel like is going to give me the ability to be more ecologically effective in my farming practices. One of the things I like to say is when you walk across your fields, you're walking across the top of a factory. The bacteria and the fungi and all the different soil critters, are they're eating and living year-round. We need to give them a food source year-round. The Natural Resources Conservation Service defines soil health as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. If your soil is struggling or having a deficiency or just not functioning properly, your plant is going to suffer. And there is a, a mutual working arrangement that they have. To enhance soil health, farmers are adopting a variety of conservation practices, including the use of cover crops. Cover crops help us to increase organic matter and adding diversity to the rotation to improve soil quality as far as adding microbes and organic matter to it. Cover crops enhance the capacity to withstand unfavorable weather conditions by effectively preserving moisture and nutrients within the soil. We had over an inch of rain. There's not a puddle out here. So part of that is that the oats, the roots are taking that water up. However, it's because the water can get in. I mean, you can see a, you can see a sheen on there. So we know that water is saturating in those pore spaces but we have pore spaces available to hold that water. That's the good thing. Therefore, farmers who use cover crops are taking a proactive approach to improving soil health and enhancing the long-term sustainability of their agricultural systems. But also, hopefully, make me money. The idea is that uh, if I don't have to plow as much and I'm using slightly less fertilizer to make equal crop, then uh, I'll save some money. In this video, we will hear from three farmers situated in different regions of Louisiana, north, central, and south, who have integrated cover crops into their farming practices. These farmers will discuss the various benefits that they've experienced since adopting cover crops, as well as the challenges they face. Meet Glenn Seymour, a farmer from the heart of Acadia Parish. Well, we, um, we harvested soybeans here probably two weeks ago, caught a little shower a night or two ago, and, and so now we're, we're drilling cover crops directly into a soybean residue. This is um, in preparation for a rice crop in March. Known as the rice capital of the world, Glenn's farm is located in an area with unique crop rotations and a climate that brings abundant rainfall and moisture. We grow rice, and that means the water's put on in, in May and turned loose in, in July. You harvest, you flood back up in October, water stays on, on it until the following June. That puts your soil in an anaerobic situation. In his quest to improve soil health and crop yield, Glenn has been using cover crops on his farm. With rice production and with soil health in mind, uh, you know, one of the big things is, is how can we grow a healthier rice crop that is resilient to disease pressures? Um, how can we grow a rice crop and possibly reduce some input costs in the way of nitrogen fertilizer? Glenn isn't the only Louisiana farmer who has turned to cover crops to improve soil health and crop yield. Let's meet Fred Collins, a farmer from Avoyles Parish and a retired Louisiana crop consultant. Hello, I'm Fred Collins. I'm a Avoyles Parish farmer. For seven years, Fred has been planting cover crops on his corn and soybean farm. I think I find less Italian ryegrass, less evening primrose, and uh, some of the uh, less pigweed where I have this involved, and all three of those are weeds that are hard to control. And finally, way up north in Baskin, Louisiana, we meet Ted Miller, a dairy farmer who has implemented cover crops on his operation for many years. 
We overseed our, our pastures with winter annuals. The first benefit we get from it is we get uh, winter feed from our cattle. We're in a climate where we can grow both cool season and warm season grasses. The ecological benefit of it allows us to keep a, a, a growing organism in the soil 12 months of the year, which, which has tremendous benefit for the soil biology. And we see that from that, we, we can reduce our fertilizer inputs. Uh, we don't need near as much synthetic fertilizer. Uh, we capture a lot of nitrogen that way. As we'll soon learn, these farmers share a common goal, to improve the health of their soil and increase their crop yield. Let's dive in and hear more about their experiences with cover crops. Cover cropping and overseeding has tremendous usefulness on a variety of operations, from cattle operations to row crop settings. We all know that the margins in our business every year just get tougher and tougher, and the way we can, we can combat that is by increasing our production levels. And you increase your production levels by getting everything in, in balance, planting the best seed available, having healthy soil, having the right amount of fertilizer out there. And that balance is what makes the decision between being profitable and struggling. We've seen it quantitatively reduce our fertilizer bill. Those are numbers that stick out pretty quick. We don't know all the, the science behind what's going on there, but we do see that uh, we don't have to spend what we used to spend on fertilizer. And we get a feed benefit too uh, in the cattle business. Rachel Evans who has spent years studying soil as a scientist, sheds light on her findings regarding why cover crops might actually help farmers save money. So what we're doing is we're, we're mining what we've got in our subsoil, bringing it to the surface to be used. If you've got legumes that are fixing nitrogen, and if you've got some deeper rooted tap, uh, taproot systems, fibrous root systems that are, that are going below, or mining phosphorus, mining uh, potassium, bringing that up, uh, calcium, magnesium, and with that nutrient cycling, hopefully what we're using from down below, we're not having to add from off-farm inputs. So we've got to capitalize on the, the biological activity, the free things that we get, the sunlight, the water, and the organic material in the soil to generate the fertility that we need for robust forage production. These farmers are pioneers in embracing cover crops. While a significant number of farmers in Louisiana have been hesitant to adopt these practices due to various factors. These include challenges related to weather, finances, time constraints, scientific data, and economic analysis, and to validate the cost-saving benefits. Probably one of the biggest uh, hesitations there is with, with producers when it comes to implementing cover crops is, you know, it's an added expense into their operation. Just because that field is green and it's pretty at this time of the year where everything else is, is dead or, or brown or whatever and you have a pretty field, if that green field doesn't turn into green, then you haven't accomplished anything because our business is no different than any other business. We have to have a return on a, on a dollar. If not, then because of the low margins this business, then it'll become a, an economic impact for you. It's a risk. It's, it's, an, it's adding an unknown risk into their already managed system. They have their arms around this, they know what they're doing. For those that are brand new starting into it, that's, that's a big question. That's, that's a lot to add when we've got all these other stresses and risk factors involved. The NRCS offers programs such as EQIP and CSP that provide financial assistance to farmers venturing into cover crop implementation. These programs serve as a valuable resource for sharing the costs associated with adopting cover crops, allowing farmers to ease into the practice while receiving support. From my perspective within RCS, if, if a producer comes in and we talk cover crops and we get to that point, one of my follow-up questions is going to be, what are we going to do, what is your tillage system? You know, we don't have to go from a conventional tilled system to planting cover crops and no-till 
overnight. But I feel like there should be a shift in that to where we're more conservative and, and doing minimal tillage. You know, our operation now is 100% no-till, and, um, and we grow between nine and 10,000 acres of crop, and, and we take a lot of pride in the fact that we're able to bring our farms to that level. That's probably one of the biggest savers early on in the first three years of going to limited tillage and adding cover crops is you're saving on your soil. And then you start getting the infiltration, the pore space, et cetera, and, and building and building. Fertilizer keeps getting more expensive. It's not going back down anytime soon. I want to keep the soil fertility in the field where the plants can get to it, not having to replace it every six months. Rachel emphasizes that one of the crucial factors for successful utilization of cover crops is the precise timing of planting, burn down, and planting of cash crops. We want to see a cover crop put in right after that cash crop comes out. Now sometimes that's very difficult to do, that logistics wise, uh, the farmer's got a lot going on. The earlier we can plant that cover crop in the fall season, the more biomass we, we can grow before the cool weather, the frost sets in and starts to, to retard the, the cover crop growth. However, this aspect often becomes overwhelming for farmers due to the multitude of tasks and responsibilities they face throughout the year. I would say that it's been a learning experience for sure. Uh, I started out using just cereal rye. If they can't get a cover crop in before the middle of October, they're really shorting themselves on biomass growth. It's a delicate balance in a cycle uh, that the farmer's trying to hit one versus the other. And that's, that's a risk that they're trying to take. And you know, they, they start out with one cash crop and then they have to change because the market changes and they've decided, well, didn't get the wind for corn, now I've got to go to beans. So that's why we like to see a mix of covers as well instead of, instead of just a one monoculture. If it's possible, you can get a small grain and a legume in there. That kind of gives a broad base. Uh, or a, a small grain and a, a brassica. You, you kind of cover all, all bases with two different types of cover crops and two different rooting systems in there. But what I found that if I burn down late and, and I, I try to go in there with the, the row cleaners, I've had issues with sometimes the, uh, the cereal rye in particular wanting to ball up in my row cleaners. And so I've switched to a a shark tooth this year from the spike that I had in the past, and I'm hoping that's going to give me better uh, ability to, to sh you know, shred through the, uh, the trash and not cause so much problems. Fortunately, the NRCS provides valuable technical assistance to alleviate the feeling of being overwhelmed and offers a range of resources aimed at helping farmers successfully implement cover crops. We start talking to them early in the year about it. Um, and you know what what can we help you with can we help you with getting getting in contact with different seed dealers can we help you uh, try to figure out what cover you want to plant and how much you need to plant these supportive measures are designed to empower farmers with the necessary guidance and tools for incorporating cover crops into their agricultural practices we're building a network um, hopefully, of, of soil, a soil health network, so to speak, with these farmers. So they're just not sitting there on their own going, I don't know what to do, you know, because it requires a lot of help. It requires a lot of forethought. Um, and, and we don't want to just see anybody just sitting there going, I don't know what to do or even where to go. Usually by year three is when most farmers are saying yes, they're, they're definitely seeing the improvements. Uh, they're seeing usually better infiltration uh, right off the bat. It may take four to five years in order to see an organic matter improvement, but within three years you will see a soil structure improvement. You'll see less of a compaction zone, so it's a healing process. And the first year is just trying to get that, that cover in there, that farmer understanding how to manage a cover crop. It's not something that I'll just try it once and if it doesn't work, I won't try it again. It's kind of, it's a commitment. Fred says it took approximately three years to witness noticeable improvements in his fields, including enhanced water penetration into the soil. I mean, if you have a field that's next to it that's 
that's been plowed conventionally and then a field that's no-tilled. Even after three years, you puddle so much where you conventionally till because you have that subsoil layer of plow pan and you don't have that where you started developing uh, channels which the water can uh, move down into the, uh, the ground level. I would tell them that land is an asset just like any other. I would compare it to a rent house. You know, if you had a rent house that you're constantly putting tenants in every year and you didn't do anything to it, it's gonna run down to the ground. These practices, they're a tool for these producers to use to increase sustainability on their land as far as production over the long term. Remember that you can't take out all the time and you have to put back in, you know, to adopt a more long-term mindset with delayed gratification. If I accomplish anything in soil health, at 66 years old, where my agriculture career is on, on the decline, I hope the operation we have now with no-till farming and soil health in mind, if the most important thing for me is if I can pass the torch on to the next generation, which is my sons and my grandsons and so on down the, down the line, that is gonna be um, a good legacy for me. I, I would be very happy if, if, that's how, if that's how I'm remembered. We have witnessed the journey of these farmers embracing cover crops and their efforts to improve soil health. May their stories inspire us all to nurture our land, protect our environment, and cultivate healthy soils for generations to come. <laughs>